The Death and Funeral of Queen Charlotte By early 1811, King George was already experiencing vision loss and enduring intense physical suffering from severe ailments, separate from his mental illness. He was confined to a serene and isolated section of Windsor Castle. At first, the Queen would occasionally visit him there, accompanied by one or more of his caretakers or her children. However, his increasingly erratic and peculiar behaviour frightened and saddened her to such extent that she ceased visiting him after the summer of 1812. As her husband descended further into madness, her own demeanour began to change as well. Alongside growing depression, the Queen also underwent frequent and unpredictable mood swings. These ongoing fluctuations in her character strained her relationships with her children, courtiers and close friends. Gradually, Queen Charlotte started to retreat from public life, dedicating more and more of her time to her country residence, Frogmore House, located on the Windsor Castle grounds. During the later years of her life, she did make a significant effort to mend her relationships with her children, including the Prince of Wales. Regrettably, Queen Charlotte never had a particularly strong bond with her granddaughter, who shared her name, Princess Charlotte of Wales. Princess Charlotte held a deep affection for her grandfather, King George, who had always shown her great kindness. However, her grandmother, Queen Charlotte, consistently presented herself as a cold and strict authority figure, beginning from when the princess was a young girl growing up with largely indifferent parents. Despite the strain in their relationship, Queen Charlotte was overjoyed upon hearing the news of her granddaughter's pregnancy. The Queen understood that the child would secure the throne for her husband's family in the next generation. Therefore, the death of the Princess Charlotte during childbirth in November of 1817 was a tremendous blow to the Queen. Her health noticeably began to decline following the loss of her granddaughter and great-grandson. By the spring of 1818, Queen Charlotte started experiencing sporadic seizures without any clear physical explanation according to her doctors. Having reached the age of 74 that May, she was no longer a young woman and was ultimately diagnosed with dropsy. Her strength began to wane and by summer, walking became increasingly challenging for the Queen. Her joints often ached severely and her legs frequently swelled. In July of 1818, two of her younger sons, who had recently married German princesses, returned to Britain with their new brides. A double wedding ceremony for the royal couples was scheduled to take place at Windsor Castle later that month. The Queen intended to travel from London to Windsor in order to attend her son's double wedding, with the hope of recovering her health at the country retreat, Frogmore House. Unfortunately, her illness worsened during the journey, rendering her too frail and weak to continue. Consequently, her entourage made a stop at Dutch House, also known as Kew Palace, situated within the grounds of Kew Gardens, allowing the Queen to rest and regain her strength. After a few days, as it became evident that the ailing Queen was not improving, it was decided to hold the weddings for the Duke of Clarence and the Duke of Kent in the drawing room of Dutch House on Saturday the 11th of July 1818. The Prince Regent and several of his siblings attended the ceremony and Queen Charlotte was carefully carried downstairs and placed in a chair that provided her a view of her sons and brides exchanging vows in English. She managed to greet the members of the intimate wedding party and spent a brief moment with them after the ceremony. However, Queen Charlotte's weakness prevented her from attending the elegant outdoor wedding breakfast held in Kew Gardens. As the wedding party made their way into the gardens, the Queen was carried back upstairs to her bedchamber. The Queen and her attune remained at Kew Palace throughout the summer. Over the following weeks, the Prince Regent and most of her other children visited her. In August, she was carried out to the gardens in her carriage for a short outing on most days and everyone hoped that she would soon regain enough strength to continue her journey to Windsor Castle. But she remained too feeble and delicate to be transported. Queen Charlotte received care from Sir Francis Milman and Sir Henry Halford, both of whom were appointed as physicians to the King. 
They periodically provided updates on the Queen's health during her stay at Kew Palace, bulletins that were issued. The Queen has had several hours of sleep again, but it does not appear to have had any visible impact on her state and Her Majesty's condition. Throughout the rest of the summer and early autumn, the unmarried princesses and most of the princes made multiple visits to Dutch House, hoping to uplift their mother's spirits. It seemed that during these visits the Queen was able to mend her relationships with her children, and even the Prince Regent made several trips to Kew during those weeks to spend time with his mother. There were moments when the Queen seemed to rally, and her family held hope that her health was slowly improving. However, tragically, she developed a severe case of pneumonia, which her weakened state made it difficult to combat. On the morning of Tuesday the 17th of November 1818, the Queen's physicians Milman and Halford issued the following bulletin. The Queen's condition last night was extremely critical and precarious. Her Majesty remains very ill this morning. The same update on the Queen's health was conveyed directly to the royal family, prompting those who could travel to Kew Palace for what they anticipated would be their final visit with their family matriarch. When her family arrived, Queen Charlotte expressed a desire to leave her bed, and her servants carefully carried her to her armchair near the fireplace. Her two eldest sons, the Regent and the Duke of York, were present in her bedchamber that afternoon, accompanied by two of her daughters, Princess Augusta and Princess Mary. They sat together, engaging in quiet conversation for a while, and the Regent sat beside his mother and held her hand. At around one o'clock in the afternoon, she took a long breath and passed away. The following day, the following statement was released to the public. Her Majesty passed away around one o'clock on Tuesday the 17th of November 1818, at the age of 74. Her demise resulted from a gradual accumulation of fluid in her limbs and chest, which no medications could alleviate. Despite a lengthy illness, she faced it with remarkable fortitude and resignation, bringing an end to her life. At the time of her death, Queen Charlotte held the record as Britain's longest-serving royal consort. However, she recently relinquished that title when the current Duke of Edinburgh surpassed her tenure, making her the second longest serving royal consort. Although her husband, King George III, had been alive during her passing, he suffered from blindness, near deafness, lameness, dementia, and his ongoing mental illness. It remains uncertain whether he was informed of her death, and even if he had been, his ability to comprehend such news would have been highly unlikely. Several days were devoted to planning the funeral arrangements, and during this period the Queen's body was prepared for burial at Kew Palace, where it lay in state of mourning privately for approximately two days. Then, at approximately nine o'clock in the morning of Wednesday the 2nd of December 1818, the Queen's coffin was draped in a black pool and placed in a hearse drawn by eight black Hanovian horses, belonging to the Queen herself for the final journey to Windsor, passing through London. The procession included multiple carriages pulled by black horses, which would carry the Prince Regent and his brothers to the funeral service. Mounted lances formed an honorary guard accompanying the procession to Frogmore House, the Queen's country retreat. Around seven o'clock in the evening, upon reaching Frogmore House, the Prince Regent, assuming the role of Chief Mourner, took his place in the first carriage following the hearse. His brothers then accompanied the other carriages, and the chief servants of the King, Queen, Prince of Wales and the Royal Family, all attired in deep mourning attire of scarlet livery and black scarves and hat bands, joined the procession, each carrying a lit flambeau. Following them were forty year men of guard, followed by the mounted trumpeters and kettle drummers of the horse guards. On foot, the foot guards marched with their fifties and drums.